Hi folks, this video is designed to help you get your head around the content that might be expected of you um, for the assessment uh, standard number 92022, so that's the genetics NCEA level 1 standard. Um, I'm going to use a sample question from NZQA that you can find on the NZQA website and then I'm going to generate some other exam questions and use those to discuss the sorts of um, things that might be expected of you in the exam. Bear in mind, please, that this is just you know, my ideas and interpretation, um, and so there may be some things that don't necessarily match up, but I think everything that I've put together here fits with what's in the explanatory notes um, and the supporting materials for this standard. So um, to start us off, we're going to have a look at the sample question that's already on NZQA. Um, so this is about the allele for HIV resistance. The human immunodeficiency virus is a virus that infects the white blood cells of the human immune system. Individuals who have a normal CCR5 gene are susceptible to HIV infection. Mutations can occur in this gene, which results in a mutant CCR5 allele. Individuals who are homozygous for the mutant CCR5 allele are completely resistant to HIV, while individuals who are heterozygous are still susceptible to HIV infection. So there's a few words in there that you need to know. Homozygous means two of the same um, gene or allele. Um, heterozygous means two different alleles for that uh, condition. The exam will probably ask you about diseases or uh, you know, genetic diseases or something similar. You aren't necessarily expected to know that genetic condition. You're just expected to be able to interpret the information that's given to you. But obviously, it kind of helps you get your head around things if you're aware of a few already. So the first question asks us to explain how a mutation in the CCR5 gene is able to provide resistance to HIV. And it gives us a number of terms that we've got to include. So to help us understand this one, um, here's a pretty standard diagram showing a cell, a nucleus, that the chromosomes are these structures held inside the nucleus. That's, the, that's made of DNA and provides the, the coding for proteins in the body. Um, each gene or region on that chromosome provides a specific set of instructions for one specific protein to be made and that protein will go on and either independently or interact with other proteins to um, relate to characteristics that may be expressed in that organism. The deoxyribonucleic acid is made, made of these base pairs. You don't need to know the sequencing of the base pairs for your assessment but it's always useful to, 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 to learn these things anyway. And so the bases are called adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and they always pair up in that way with um, adenine joining with thymine, cytosine joining with guanine in DNA. Um, this diagram shows you the sugar phosphate backbone and the nucleotide base pairs, but you don't need to know that for your assessment. All right, so to respond to the question then, the CCR5 gene is a sequence of nucleotide bases in the deoxyribonucleic acid on one section of a chromosome that provides the instructions for one specific protein. This protein determines a phenotype, the expression of a genotype. A mutation is a random, unpredictable change in this base sequence. This creates a new version of the gene known as an allele. In the case above, this new allele has resulted in a different protein being produced and a different possible phenotype i.e. being resistant to HIV. So for achieved level, you really just need to know a whole load of definitions, and these are some of the key ones that you must know going into your exam. I'd also make sure that you have that wording for mutation, um, kind of in your own mind, ready to use in the exam. Okay, so discuss how the CCR5 gene mutation can be passed on to the next generation, leading to variation in the population. So this is generally where you're kind of pushing more towards the merit and excellence level. Um, there's two bullet points we should include. I'm going to do the first one here, and then I'll um, do the second one on a fresh screen. So... Um, we should consider how sexual reproduction, including meiosis, contributes to genetic variation. Now, under this standard, you don't need to know a lot of the detail about meiosis, but I'll run through a little bit of it here. The important steps are that you start off with what is called a diploid um, cell. 
and then that diploid cell is going to um, split twice, um, leading to the production of four haploid gametes. So the gametes are your sperm or your egg cells um, in humans, could be pollen, ova, etc. Um, in plants. And so we're ultimately going from one diploid cell, i.e. containing the full um, number of chromosomes for that uh, for an individual of that species and then it's producing four haploid gametes i.e. four sex cells with half the genetic information so that two of those um, gametes from different individuals when they fuse and fertilize to form a zygote are going to give you the full genetic component again so back to in humans 46 chromosomes. Um, you don't need to know these intermediate steps at level one, but a couple that I'm going to mention are independent assortment and crossing over, and then combined with segregation, the separating out of those chromosomes, that rearranges the uh, genes that one parent has and passes on half of those to the offspring through that gamete. And so it's a way of reshuffling the existing parental genes so that half of the genetic material of a father will be passed on to a child and half of the mother's genetic material will be passed on to the, the, to the child. However, the genes that are passed on are not necessarily the exact same chromosomes that either of those parents had because those chromosomes have been, the genes on those chromosomes have been reshuffled through uh, crossing over. So if you want to learn more about that, I'd have a look in another video. You don't need to know those specific details, but it might be useful to use those terms for your exam. Okay, so to answer that first part of the question then, in order for a mutation to be passed on to the next generation, the mutation must occur in a gamete as only that genetic information is passed on um, through fertilization. Sexual reproduction involves the formation of haploid gametes through the process of meiosis. During meiosis, independent assortment and crossing over are steps that reshuffle the alleles, resulting in a gamete that contains chromosomes that are not identical to those from the parent. Once these genetically unique gametes fuse into a zygote, that offspring will have a new assortment of the existing parental alleles, increasing genetic variation. So the second bullet point here represents a concept that you really need to be ready to talk about in your exam. It's towards the excellence level, and that's the advantages of genetic variation in a population. Please note that the standard doesn't expect you to identify certain mutations as being good or bad, but you should be able to discuss the implications of genetic variation, i.e. you know, what, what, what might happen if a population has more genetic variation or less genetic variation. So, Genetic variation through sexual reproduction is an advantage in a population as some individuals will have a genotype, i.e. a combination of alleles, that may provide an advantage, in this case resistance to HIV. Resistant individuals have a selective advantage, increasing their chance to survive, to reach reproductive maturity, the age that they can produce offspring, and potentially passing on the advantageous allele to their offspring. Over multiple generations, this can increase the prevalence or the occurrence of that allele in the population, so more and more individuals become resistant to the disease. Okay, I'm going to talk, I'm going to use cystic fibrosis as a concept to discuss a few other ideas that you might need to be aware of. So here we've got um, a diagram showing two what are called carriers, the mother and father. Um, neither of them express cystic fibrosis. I should say cystic fibrosis is a condition where um, you produce a really thick mucus in your lungs and your digestive system and other organs, and that normally causes quite a lot of problems for the individual. And so looking at their four offspring, um, the the, the graphic here gives us the idea that 25% um, of their offspring would be likely to have cystic fibrosis. 50% um, of their offspring would be carriers, i.e. they would have two copies, uh, two different copies of the allele, one that would mean one for, for not being having cystic fibrosis and one for having cystic fibrosis, but they won't express cystic fibrosis, so you wouldn't, they wouldn't be sufferers. Um, and then one out of four, 25% would be unaffected because they would inherit the dominant allele um, from each parent. So we'll look at how those alleles are inherited. Um, and we're going to use something called a Punnett square to do that. Hopefully you've seen these already. So we're going to take both the mother and the father's genotype 
Um, and so that is because they're carriers, we know that they have one dominant and one recessive. They are said to be heterozygous for cystic fibrosis, i.e. they've got one of each allele. We then look at how those alleles can be um, inherited in the gametes or produced in the gametes. And so each parent can produce gametes that either have the dominant allele or the recessive allele. And so then we use the Punnett square. There's four boxes in the Punnett square. That doesn't mean that there's going to be four offspring. It's just giving you an idea of the likelihood of any um, mating, uh, uh, reproduction, what the chances are of the offspring having a specific genotype. So by combining the um, two dominant alleles, we get a heterozygous, uh, sorry, a, a homozygous dominant uh, genotype here. I've color coded them so you can kind of see which allele is coming from which parent, but it doesn't really matter which one's male or female. The next genotype, we're taking the dominant F and the recessive um, uh, blue F, um, combining those to make a heterozygous genotype. So that would be a carrier. Um, bottom left box, we've taken the dominant blue and the recessive red. Um, by convention, we normally write the dominant allele first when there is a heterozygous genotype. And then in the bottom corner, you'll hopefully be able to see, we're going to join both of those recessive Fs. And so that bottom quarter, uh, bottom right quarter represents an individual who would be a sufferer of cystic fibrosis. So that's how a Punnett square works. Um, and so we might use that to explain how a person can carry the cystic fibrosis allele but not suffer from cystic fibrosis. So any person will have two alleles or versions of the gene controlling the presence or absence of cystic fibrosis. One will be inherited from each parent. If either allele is dominant, then the phenotype will be expressed, then that phenotype will be expressed as the proteins associated with that allele will be produced, i.e. not having cystic fibrosis. The recessive allele will only be expressed if the individual has two copies of the recessive allele, i.e. if they are homozygous recessive. A heterozygous individual will have one of each allele, so why they won't suffer from cystic fibrosis, there's a 50% chance that any of their gametes will transfer the recessive allele to their offspring. And we say that that person is a carrier of the cystic fibrosis allele because they could pass it on, but they're not sufferers. Okay, so here's another what might be called a gene tracking tool. Um, this is a pedigree chart looking at um, the occurrence of cystic fibrosis in a family. The key gives us some information about the gender of the individuals and whether they are affected or unaffected. And so we might be expected to, uh, to, to use that to work out the genotypes of individuals in the pedigree chart. And this might be used to help make predictions about the likelihood of certain offspring um, having cystic fibrosis. And so I've identified four names in the table um, and we're going to work through the genotypes for those individuals. So starting with Nico, we can see that with that color, um, Nico is an affected male, um, male because of the square box and the color indicates the presence or absence of cystic fibrosis. And so we know as a, an affected male, we know that cystic fibrosis is a recessive characteristic. And so Nico must be um, lowercase f, lowercase f, so homozygous recessive. Dave, um, Nico's father, um, has uh, we're, we're, look, we're identifying his genotype, and so we know that Dave and Julia, neither of them have cystic fibrosis, but they've had an offspring that does, which means that both of them must be carrying um, the recessive allele, and their other allele, because they're unaffected, must be the dominant one. So both Dave and Julia have to be heterozygous for cystic fibrosis. So that brings us to Luke, and so Luke is the son uh, of Dave and Julia, um, or the other one of the, one of the children of Dave and Julia. Um, Luke is unaffected. Now, from this, we can see that Luke has children, both Stephen and Erica, who are unaffected, um, and we know already that Luke's parents were both carriers. So it's possible that Luke has inherited the dominant allele from both parents, and is therefore homozygous dominant. Um, it's also possible that Luke has inherited one dominant allele and one recessive allele from each of his parents, and so is a carrier. And it might be that, you know, we would have to, Luke and Dawn might have to have more children um, in order for us to determine whether it was likely that Luke was a carrier or was homozygous dominant. 
for this condition. So only having two offspring isn't enough to kind of make a real judgment call there. Um, it's possible that, um, you know, Luke is a carrier. It doesn't exclude them from being a carrier just because they haven't yet had any children that are affected. And so Luke's genotype is either um, homozygous dominant or heterozygous for cystic fibrosis. Now, um, the standard talks about another possible, so apart from like genetic conditions, um, like diseases, um, you could also be um, discussing albinism. Um, albinism is where the uh, the individual doesn't produce any melanin and so that normally produces really um, white individuals um, with distinctive red eyes. Now um, the standard talks about that as being New Zealand wild animals I think from memory um, and so there's only really a few examples of that. Um, a kiwi, um, a hedgehog or a, a snail um, are the only ones I can remember off the top of my head that actually um, have albinism. In theory, I guess it could be a made up example. Um, so just giving you a bit of a heads up to be aware of that one. So here's a New Zealand example um, of how gene tracking might be used. And it's what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to show you an example. Look, this one's much more complex, I expect, than you would be given in the exam. Uh, there's a lot going on in this in this figure. Um, this has been taken from a relatively recent paper um, looking at how um, gene tracking is used to help uh, protect um, the reproductive success of kakapo. And so since 2020, um, we've used this pedigree to inform the translocation, that's the moving of kakapo among five island populations to try and maximize genetic diversity. Um, I've noted off at the side here from the paper, in 2018, almost all living kakapo, that's 169 individuals, were genetically sequenced. Um, and then that allowed individual birds to be monitored or moved to new areas. And the colored pedigree chart here is used for its, its levels of inbreeding. And so the brown is more inbred and the, the green is less inbred. Um, so in terms of what's going on here and how it might be used. Um, we can see in the chart that there's different regions around New Zealand where historical sightings of Kākāpō existed, but all of the current populations are kind of on these small islands where they're, it's easier to protect them um, and to, to monitor what's going on. So how is gene tracking used to help the endangered Kākāpō population? Um, gene tracking of Kākāpō allows the level of inbreeding, that's mating between closely related individuals, to be measured. Inbreeding causes genetic defects to occur with higher frequency, and this can reduce fertility, which threatens the population. Inbreeding can be prevented by moving individual Kākāpō from one island to another island with unrelated potential mates. This introduces different alleles into each island population, increasing genetic variation. Increased genetic variation is advantageous as it is less likely that all members of a population will be susceptible to threats like disease. It also reduces the risk of genetic defects from inbreeding. Knowing the genotypes of mating kakapo also allows predictions to be made about their offspring and chicks that may be at, low risk, at risk of low weight or poor health can be identified and closely monitored with possible intervention that improves their chances of surviving to reproductive age themselves. And so what we see in that chart from before is um, the lines that are going from, the, from one individual to another place are where that individual has been moved from a location to a new location to try to encourage that reproduct reproductive um, success of the population as a whole. All right, I hope that was helpful for you. Um, if you pop any questions in comments, I'll see what I can do to, to respond to those. And all the best for your exam.